Okay, hello everyone. Good evening and welcome to the Evanston History Center's Under the Buffalo series. I'm Eden Geron Perlman, Executive Director of the History Center, and I'm so happy to see all of you online tonight. We have a terrific program this evening. Joining us from just outside Boston is Professor Christopher H. Evans, author of the recently published Do Everything, the biography of Francis Willard. I know we're all very much looking forward to hearing Dr. Evans' presentation. Before I introduce, I'm gonna call him Chris. Chris, because we're friends now. <laughs> Before I introduce Chris, let me just mention uh, an upcoming event. Next month, we will host our 48th annual Mother's Day Housewalk. This will be our first time since 2019 that we will go inside the houses on the housewalk. We hope you will mark your calendars and join us for this very special event on Mother's Day, Sunday, May 14th. Tickets are on sale now and we'll post a link. You can get them on our website and, they're, uh, and we'll post a link in the chat. And now we are very happy to welcome our speaker, Christopher Evans. Dr. Evans' biography Francis Willard, of Francis Willard, Do Everything, the biography of Francis Willard, is the first biography of Willard in 35 years. As many of you know, Willard was one of the most prominent American social reformers of the late 19th century. And she made her home in Evanston for three decades. Tonight, Dr. Evans will discuss Willard's life her contributions as a reformer and her connections to Evanston. Dr. Evans is a professor of history, excuse me, of the history of Christianity and Methodist studies at Boston University School of Theology. He received his PhD. To let a couple people in. Um, he received his PhD in religious and theological studies from Northwestern University and Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. His research focuses on 19th and 20th century Christianity, American religious history, transatlantic Methodism, method. <laughs> you got it right. <laughs> Methodism and the Methodist contributions to social reform movements. He has lectured widely in academic and church conferences on the topic of Methodist history and American religion and the religion in contemporary culture. He's the author of several books, including The Faith of 50 Million, Baseball, Religion, and American Culture, which is co-edited with William Herzog the second, which I think is very appropriate to name right now at the beginning of baseball season, every Cubs fans hopeful time of the year. And I'm married our... to a Cub fan too, <laughs> uh, Eden, just uh, so you, to let you, you know. know our, then you know our pain. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. The social gospel in American religion is his other book. We got a little sidetracked on baseball list. Those of you who know me know my comment sidetrack. Thank you so much, Chris, for being with us tonight. Just a reminder, we'll have Q&A after the presentation. If you have questions, please use the chat feature and type your questions there. If you'd like to ask your questions live, please let us know by raising your hand. Then we'll call on you and you can unmute your microphone and join us for the discussion. So now let's welcome Chris Evans, thanks so oh, much. Thank you, Eden, thank you. And, and uh, what, in terms of getting started, I am just going to, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to put up for everyone and hopefully uh, hopefully you can, everyone can see that okay. Uh, I, first of all, let me say just how delighted I am to be a part of this series with you tonight. And it's especially rewarding for me as a historian to be surrounded by other people who love history. And, and I commented to Jenny and Eden before, uh, before we got started this evening that 
Oh, the, the greater Chicago area is just rich with history. It tells a great deal about the, the American story. And, and I think Francis Willard is a key part of that story and, and a story that deserves to be told quite, quite frequently. As, as Eden mentioned, my book is the first biography that has been written on Francis Willard in, in over 35 years now. A historian, uh, American historian named Ruth Borden uh, published uh, quite a bit, not only on Willard, but uh, also on the story of the women's temperance movement, which is a key part of Francis Willard's story that I'm going to be telling tonight. I think a, a good way to, to begin is, is just, uh, if you look at my PowerPoint screen, you see an image of two stained glass window panes, uh, which are actually from uh, the, the Boston University Chapel that was named after the fourth president of, of BU, as we refer to it here, uh, um, uh, Daniel Marsh. And Marsh, like many of the early presidents of Boston University, was a good Methodist. Uh, he was a Methodist minister, and actually BU and Northwestern have quite a bit in common in terms of their origins. But when the Boston University campus, the current location, was constructed uh, right after the Second World War, uh, Marsh took great pains to uh, designed the windows that would be in, in the, the sanctuary of the new university chapel. And a lot of the stained glass windows were, included uh, many prominent American figures in American history. And part of what's interesting about the windows, the only uh, window to depict a woman uh, was Frances Willard. And this tells you something about the kind of uh, fame that Willard had within the context of her generation. Uh, Marsh came of age in the late 19th century, where, where really the name of Francis Willard was uh, a household way, name in the country. Uh, by, by one account, uh, uh, an expression that was used quite a bit in American popular culture in the, at the end of the 19th century, that the three most prominent Americans were God, Buffalo Bill, and Francis Willard. So Willard was an extremely well-known figure, but her popularity in many respects came about because of the role that she played in, in a variety of social reform movements. And tonight I'm going to outline uh, several of her contributions very briefly, particularly in terms of issues of women's rights, uh, she was also in, involved in causes of social economic reform. And the, 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 the cause that in many respects is, is not particularly well understood today, I think. Uh, and, and as I'll talk about in just a few minutes, the, the history of the temperance movement that had deep roots in 19th century America and was a movement that contributed a great deal to the eventual passing of the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution in, in 1919 uh, has, has oftentimes been caricatured. But one of the things that, that I think is very, very important to realize is that temperance was probably one of the most important social issues of the 19th century. And most major reformers of that century, uh, including people like Susan B. Anthony, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Frederick Douglass, were all strong advocates of temperance and prohibition. And part of what I want to do tonight is outline a little bit of that history and how Willard fits into it. Uh, I'm also going to say quite a bit about the organization that Willard led, the, the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which by the 1890s was, was probably the largest women's rights organization in the world. And part of what I try to do in the book is, is, is emphasize not only the centrality of Willard's leadership, of that organization, 
But I want to spotlight the title of the book, Do Everything, which became Frances Willard's motto in terms of how she believed that women needed to take up any and all causes that were that they felt were important. And in, in many respects, the WCTU became kind of a clearinghouse for women's activism that I don't think is fully appreciated today. But, but as I'll mention and discuss a little bit with you, the WCTU played a very, very formative role, not just in terms of pushing for a prohibition amendment to the US Constitution, but a variety of different issues, particularly related to women's suffrage. Um, so Willard is a major figure of the Gilded Age, this period of the late 19th century uh, that is oftentimes associated with the rise of industrial capitalism. Uh, many of you are certainly aware of the fact that this was the time period where Chicago really came into its own as a city with the 1893 Columbian Exposition. And, and Willard was very much at the center of that time. And in many respects, she was a key critic of a number of the, uh, particularly the economic practices of the era uh, uh, that, that it tended to exploit women and children. And, and I think I would say, and one of the things that I frankly argue in the book, for all of the ways that Willard you often used a very traditional way of talking about the role of the family, the centrality of the family in American life. And at times she could use from the standpoint of our ears, a very traditional idiom of talking about women and the role of women in society. But the other part of it, she, she was quite radical in terms of a lot of the social causes she, she uh, advocated. And, and I even make the claim that in some ways, I think she was much more radical than uh, better known women today, such as Anthony, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, I, I do like the, uh, the tributes uh, to to Willard that you find in terms of her her subsequent le legacy, and I'm especially drawn to uh, this one that came from her good friend Susan B. Anthony, who, when when learning of Willard's death, wrote that she was a bunch of magnetism, possessing that occult force which all leaders must have. I never approached her, but what I felt my nerves tingle from her magnetism. She seemed to have the power so seldom possessed to take in everything at once. She was the first woman, uh, and many of you I think might be aware of this already, she was the first woman to have a statue uh, placed in Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol in 1905. The state of Illinois uh, represented chose her as one of the individuals to be represented in, in Statuary Hall. And you can still see her sat statue today in DC. She was also elected to the National Women's Hall of Fame uh, in beautiful, beautiful Seneca Falls, uh, New York in 20, 2000. Uh, some of you perhaps have been to the National Women's Hall of Fame. It's a fantastic place. and. That part of Western New York, which is my own st old stomping grounds uh, where I lived many years and was also uh, the area of the country where Willard was actually born in 1839 uh, is, a, is a fascinating area for particularly the history of uh, American religious history. But uh, Willard is, 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 is part of the, the gallery of women that has been honored by that organization and you can find out more about uh, Willard uh, at, at the uh, National Women's Hall of Fame website. Oh, and then I have to mention the, the fact that uh, Frances Willard was a proud Evanstonian. Uh, if you have been to the Willard House and Museum in, in Evanston, you, you, you see 
uh, the place where Willard spent many of her uh, years uh, with, uh, when she was an adult, uh, when, when in, in the rare instances that she wasn't traveling and, and was in town, she loved Evanston. In the early 1890s, she published a wonderful book called A Classic Town, The Story of Evanston. And it's an interesting book to read because you learn a lot about Evanston's early history. Her family moved there in the late 1850s. So there, there really wasn't much of a town still to see, but uh, Willard marveled at Evanston. And it was a place that was not only her home, but it was very much the, the nerve center of the, of the women's Christian temperance movement. And her home at various times in the 1880s and 1890s hosted a number of important uh, local dignitaries, politicians, uh, political leaders, other reformers. Uh, the rest cottage in, in Evanston was very much the nerve center of Willard's life and the WCTU. Now, I, I said before, I think the temperance issue is not well understood today. And I think a good starting point, I, I'm going to suggest maybe some readings in addition to my book that maybe will be helpful for understanding this. Uh, W.J. Rorabaugh, who was a historian at the University of Washington, has written a number of very good books. And I still think his best is a book that was originally published in the 1970s called the Alcoholic Republic and American Tradition. And Rorabaugh lays out something that, again, I think we can lose touch of, of that, that a number of the temperance reformers like Willard were, were not simply thinking in terms of, of being moralistic Protestants, trying to prohibit people from the joys of taking a drink. But they they saw it as a social problem that that exacerbated uh, cycles of poverty, that that had economic consequences, particularly again, the way that uh, America in the through the 19th century was was moving to massive industries related to beer and hard spirits, and. Many of the temperance reformers of the 19th century saw the abuse of alcohol very much as a social, having social ramifications that went beyond the individual. Although I think another dimension to Willard's work is that it anticipated later 20th century movements such as AA and various 12-step movements that were, were designed to uh, treat victims of alcoholism not as somehow being morally lax, but suffering an illness that, that needed compassion and care. Now, some of you perhaps have, have seen Ken Burns's documentary uh, on, on the prohibition movement and particularly focused on the years when the 18th Amendment to the Constitution was law between 1920 and 1933. And Burns's documentary is based on a wonderful uh, book by uh, a writer named Dan Daniel Ockrent called Last Call. I, I think it's a wonderful, it's, an, it's a very readable book. I think the problem though with the book is that it does tend to fall into some of the same stereotypes about the, the prohibition and the temperance movement. It tends to take the perspective, again, that, you know, that the people who favored prohibition were all from rural America. They were all moralistic Protestants and they were, they were rebelling against the kind of changes uh, politically, economically, and culturally that were happening in the big cities. There's a little bit of truth to that, but uh, many of the prohibitionists uh, were were coming out of urban backgrounds, and uh, they, as I said before, they they were looking at temperance from a from a social lens, and they were seeing it oftentimes related to issues of economic inequality, uh, the the kind of uh, abuse of of resources from families 
that was oftentimes leading people into cycles of poverty and destitution, and also cycles of domestic violence, of, of men uh, taking their frustrations out on, on women and children. Uh, a much more recent book, uh, and actually this book came out uh, from Oxford University Press, the same press that published my biography, uh, written by a political science scientist named Mark Lawrence Schrad called Smashing the Liquor Machine. And Schrad really does get into uh, the economics of prohibition and, and the way that the larger temperance issue was not simply an American issue, but it had global ramifications. And, and in many ways, the U.S. is critical to that story, but it, uh, it, it extends beyond the United States. And I think part of the significance of the WCTU as an organization is that Willard saw the global reach of the temperance issue, and particularly as it related to women's rights. And she expanded it a great deal beyond its origins uh, in, in the 19th century, in, when it was founded in Cleveland, Ohio in 1874. Uh, initially, the WCTU had a philosophy that emphasized the idea that women had the power to put pressure on men and put pressure on liquor interest in the country uh, to call the spread of alcohol. And the, the first president of the WCTU was, was another Methodist woman, a uh, very uh, well-known reformer of the time named Annie Wittenmeyer. Uh, Wittenmeyer, during the Civil War, was involved in an organization called the Sanitary Commission that oftentimes worked to alleviate the, su the suffering of wounded veterans and particularly uh, uh, garnering financial support for, for war widows and families. Uh, Wittenmeyer took a very traditional view towards the WCTU's uh, mission. But over a period of several years, uh, Willard, who was based in, in Illinois and in Evanston, uh, showed that she was a very effective pop, uh, politician and uh, ultimately ousted Wittenmeyer from the presidency of the WCTU in 1879. Wittenmeyer, uh, uh, again, took a, a very conservative view, whereas Willard really saw the WCTU as an organization that was going to mobilize women uh, on a variety of different levels. And I think part of the success of the Women's Christian Temperance Union is that Willard built an organization from the ground up. Uh, some of you might be aware of the fact that uh, the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s was a time where women were organizing in a number of different ways. Uh, Part of that came through uh, missionary societies and various Protestant denominations, so-called home and foreign missionary societies that oftentimes were run and funded by women. Uh, I think many of you might be familiar uh, with the women's club movement that has a lot of connection to the greater Chicago area uh, that Willard also played a role in. Uh, and of course, the, the suffrage movement. Uh, by, by 1875, there were two uh, major suffrage organizations in the United States, uh, the National uh, Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association. Uh, ultimately, those two groups would merge. But those organizations in comparison to the WCTU, particularly the suffrage organizations, were, were made up of women of a few thousand. Whereas by the time that Willard died in 1898, the, the membership of the WCTU in the United States was almost to 200,000. And it also was supplemented by the fact that uh, in 1884, Willard was a catalyst 
in creating what became the world's WCTU. And by the time of Willard's death, there were uh, approximately 40 countries that had uh, WCTU chapters, including chapters in, in countries like uh, Australia, New Zealand, and, and Japan. Now, Do Everything, again, was, was a very, it, it was a motto that Willard took to heart. But it also was a reflection, I think, too, of, of just how she felt that, that not all women are alike. Uh, they're going to have very different interests. But why don't we build an organization that allows women to pick the causes that they're going to pursue? And again, part of the WCTU structure that Willard built was, was very much predicated on a strong local presence. Uh, in, in, when Willard became president of the WCTU, uh, she wrote and spoke all over the country. She, she traveled by train. Uh, through uh, most of the states, as a matter of fact, all of the states in the U.S. at the time, uh, in the continental U.S., and she was a master of publicity. I talk about th this in my book, that whenever Willard came into a town, the press was ready to receive her. Uh, she oftentimes held huge temperance rallies where uh, she her speeches were, were, uh, were recorded and reprinted in paper. Uh, in an age before social media, Willard was someone who knew how to cultivate, uh, make a big splash in the media. And she encouraged other women to do this. So on one hand, the WCTU headquarters in Chicago and in Evanston did have a number of leaders that, that were very much at the core of Willard's friendship networks. But the, the other dimension of this, though, was uh, Willard allowed women to pick up causes that were important to them. So when you study the WCTU during Willard's presidency, she built up uh, all of these different work areas or departments. So, for example, they, they, there was a division in the WCTU that worked uh, that emphasized putting drinking fountains in, in public cities, public places in American cities. There was another one that revolved around uh, sending flowers or, or cultivating beauty. Uh, but you also had divisions dealing with temperance education, world peace, uh, ones that related to uh, the, the uh, animal protection, and a, a work area that was very important for Frances Willard, uh, women's suffrage. So part of Frances Willard's life, I think, is, is the fact that this woman was a political animal. Uh, she, she oftentimes, again, emphasized a message that said to women, women uh, you, you need to embody, you need to be ladylike, uh, you need to be kind, you need to project uh, an image that you, you very much are, are conforming to some of these gender norms of the time. But the other side of that was uh, she wanted women to have the right to vote. And, and this became uh, a major part of the WCTU's work. Uh, by the time Willard uh, really solidified her power base in that organization in the early 1880s. Now, when I talked about sort of the, the tradition of, of the WCTU, Willard used the term home protection to talk about making an argument that women had a right to, to vote. And in many respects, this was a, a strategy that was very different from major suffrage leaders like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who took the perspective of 
of, well, we, uh, we just want women to vote because it's right, it's just, and that's, that's the end of the story. They, they used a very uh, strong, what you could probably call natural law argument, enlightenment argument, uh, demanding the right to vote. And on one hand, Willard didn't disagree with that at all. Uh, she felt very strongly that, that women as well as men, uh, they, they embodied the same type of intellectual capacities. They were human, they had inherent rights, but she also realized that even among women, there, were, there was going to be resistance to what, what was at the time a very radical message. So part of the way that Willard used uh, temperance or prohibition, it became a wedge issue for her to talk about suffrage. And in the late 19th century, uh, with, with the, within the larger history of the temperance movement in the United States. And this is, again, was a strategy that uh, political reformers had been using for many, many years. Uh, in the state of Maine, uh, there was a very famous politician called, named Neil Dow, who actually, as mayor of Portland uh, in 1850s, succeeded in passing what, what were called dry laws, uh, prohibiting the, the sale and distribution of alcoholic beverages. And, and it, was a, it was a movement that really did galvanize, I think, uh, a later generation of women like Willard to take up temperance work. But the idea was you, you emphasized the fact that women, because of the, the, the high stakes of alcohol abuse, and because this was a moral in, issue that impacted families, women should have a say in terms of whether or not a, a, a town or a municipality passed laws that would prohibit uh, saloon licensing. So part of what Willard had done in the 1870s in Illinois, she lobbied the state legislature uh, unsuccessfully, but it, it was a, a kind of a first step of the kind of activism that she promoted. She was trying to allow uh, this, uh, to, to basically allow women to vote on local option measures in, in towns and municipalities so that they could have a say in saloon licensing. Now, the interesting thing is, and this was part of Willard's strategy, um, I haven't mentioned yet that Willard, as a devout uh, Methodist uh, and, and someone, again, who, who really uh, saw her faith as central to her reform efforts, oftentimes liked to reference uh, a scriptural verse from Matthew 10, verse 6, that women needed to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So in a sense, she believed in the idea that you killed more, uh, you, you could get your way quicker with kindness and a little sugar than with a lot of vitriol. But, but she would make the argument repeatedly to her audiences, well, let women vote on the saloon. And indeed, uh, there were several referendums in different states in the late uh, 19th century that did allow women the right to vote on these kind of moral questions. But then she took it a step further. Uh, she said, well, you know, if women can vote uh, on questions of prohibition, then they ought to be able to vote on other questions that affect women. Uh, so she was a very strong advocate of women in the workplace and uh, advocated for measures such as equal pay for equal work. Uh, she was very much concerned with the practices of, of uh, many business monopolies at the, at the time. But she used the argument that women, because women had such a strong moral voice in the home, they needed to take that 
to the rest of the nation. One of Willard's uh, favorite slogans was she referred to as organized mother love to talk about the work of the WCTU. So in a sense, in, a very, in very short order, Willard started from the perspective of work on the local, but then go national. And by the early 1880s, she was able to get the national WCTU uh, to uh, uh, endorse uh, suffrage for women. And this became a, a major cause for her. Uh, and it's something that I talk a lot about in the book too, that Willard became very, very active in, in a lot of uh, third party uh, agitation in the late 19th century. Uh, the Midwest in the US at that time was just loaded with all of these different third parties that were um, political parties that were emerging. And Willard became uh, a leader of a political party known as the Prohibition Party that saw part of its mission, uh, not only advocating for a prohibition amendment, but uh, also granting, uh, they put a plank in, or she was trying to get that party to endorse women's suffrage. And that was one of the, the major causes, again, that uh, she, she, she thought, again, that part of looking at any social issue required that you have multiple lenses, that you, when you talk about women's rights, you needed to think about economic justice. And when you talked about economic justice, you also had to look at that in relationship to uh, alcohol. Um, one of the things I talk again about in the book is that many WCTU leaders uh, who became very important in the 20th century to the woman suffrage movement and the campaign for the 19th century uh, came through uh, the WCTU. Uh, two women pictured here, two uh, very important women. Uh, the one dressed in white is Carrie Chapman Catt, who was actually the head of the National American Women's Suffrage Association uh, that ultimately pushed what became the 19th Amendment over the finish line. And her predecessor uh, was a woman named Anna Howard Shaw, who was a very close lieutenant of Will Willard's in the WCTU. Uh, Shaw has direct connections to where I teach at Boston University. Uh, in, in the 1880s, uh, uh, Shaw had actually received a theological degree from, from Boston University and was ordained into the Methodist ministry, although she was denied, basically denied a pulpit. And she proceeded then to go back to Boston University to get a, a medical degree. But a lot of very important temperance women had their, got their, or excuse me, as suffrage leaders had their start initially in the WCTU. Uh, part of Willard's fame, I think, and this is one of the things in the book that I, I really enjoyed uh, exploring. Willard saw part of her mission in life as encouraging young women to not be afraid of, of certain challenges. And one of the things that Willard hated about that time was the dress codes that uh, that as, it, as Willard put it, made women just adorn themselves with loads and sheets and sheets of clothes that restricted any kind of, of physical exercise. And in the mid 1880s, she published a delightful book called How to Win, a book for girls, where she's trying to encourage young women to, uh, to not be afraid of challenges, to, to pursue careers, uh, to but but try to find dignified ways to uh, go against the kind of dominant norms of society. Uh, if you've been to the Willard House, uh, you probably have seen Francis Willard's beloved bicycle, Gladys. And again, at a time period where many uh, doctors and physicians, male doctors, were emphasizing the idea that too much exercise was, was going to be detrimental to women's health. 
uh, Willard, uh, at the age of 53, learned how to ride a bicycle. And she chronicled those efforts in a delightful little book called A Wheel Within a Wheel, which is, it gives you a sense of Willard's, uh, Willard's humor and whimsy, but also this, how she, she really saw bicycle riding as a, as a political act. Uh, I won't talk a lot about this. I have to take an opportunity to put up on, on uh, the PowerPoint another of my books uh, called The Social Gospel in American Religion. Uh, this really highlights a number of people who, who came out of different faith-based traditions that are very different from what we see from the religious right today. And, and I mentioned before that Willard's Methodist faith was so central to her life. She was a loyal parishioner at First Church Evanston. And in many ways, her true ambition was to become an ordained minister. Uh, and in many respects, the way that she engaged, uh, particularly when she, pre when she spoke, at temperance rallies, at women's conventions, and public uh, pu public gatherings, she she did kind of take on the role of being a preacher. Uh, but but again, I think always behind Willard's advocacy is this idea that, in a very polite but very firm way, that men have had their time, and now it's it's the opportunity for women to come in. Uh, why should men and men only fix the penalties of their own crimes against the other half of the human race and appoint themselves legislature, judge, jury, and executive in every case? Yet every law and penalty in every statute book of this in every land was placed there by men and men alone. Uh, in the latter years of her life, uh, Willard spent a great deal of time uh, waging an international war against poverty. And, and this is where I think you see Willard. Uh, she referred to herself as a Christian socialist, but uh, she, she came out very strongly for, uh, for a lot of reform measures that ultimately would be incorporated in a number of movements that we would associate with with uh, more progressive politics of the 20th century. Part of Willard's legacy, and this is something that I, I know the Willard House has done a great deal of, of work on, uh, Willard, towards the end of her life, uh, became involved in a, a very unfortunate struggle with uh, the African-American journalist in Chicago and Ida B. Wells. And, in a lot of respects, it does reflect upon the fact that often that Willard spoke from the perspective of being a white woman. And even though the WCTU was one of the few predominantly white organizations that welcomed women, the the it's it also needs to be said that that Willard uh tended to take the perspective that Wells was a little bit of a troublemaker. Uh, part of Willard's hope as, as, a, as, a, as a politician was that she could bring together a coalition of Northern and Southern women together into this larger power block, particularly within the WCTU. The problem though that Willard faced is that she tended to ignore, uh, particularly in the 1890s when Southern lynching uh, white Southern lynching was becoming a major, major uh, public issue, and Wells was trying to draw attention to it. Uh, Willard took a very, very tepid, tepid view on, on the issue. And even though, again, Willard had fr was friends with a number of African Americans, and she was very close to Frederick Douglass, it, it does reflect one, I, I think, on, on the fact that like every person in history, she was not perfect. And she represented uh, a particular time and a particular place. I want to conclude my talk tonight um, by just reading a few uh, sh very short things from my book. 
And again, I, uh, as I mentioned to both Eden and, and Jenny, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to talk about this book. And I do hope, again, that some of you who haven't read it will be uh, perhaps want to take a look, close look at it. But I write in my conclusion that Frances Willard's life should be seen in all of its complexities. She was kind, tough, and at times intractable in her judgments. She built an international movement that not only excluded men, but emphasized that women's relationships and friendships could build a kingdom on earth often casting herself in the role of a prophet from the Hebrew scriptures, Willard took on the prophet's mantle of a visionary leader who sought to lead her army of women. She died at 58, worn out by numerous struggles and conflicts against opponents, as well as by battles among those who once supported her. Yet Willard never stopped fighting. In her autobiography, Willard reflected on her own eventual death. And she wrote, I have sincerely meant in life to stand by the great cause of poor, oppressed humanity. There must be explorers along all pathways, scouts in all armies. This has been my call from the beginning by nature and by nurture. Let me be true to its inspiriting and cheery mandate, even unto this last. As America faces ongoing manifestations of social problems related to economic justice and political equality that she herself confronted in her own lifetime, Frances Willard tells us a great deal, not simply about temperance, but about broader historical movements of social change. Remembering her example can help us chart our own visions of America's future in the 21st century, where we can learn from and be inspired by Francis Willard's dreams and visions. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was amazing. Um, I thought I knew, I, well, I do. I know a lot about Willard, but I learned, uh, I learned more tonight and uh, I sincerely appreciate it. And I know everyone, um, in here did so while we get, while we get um the privilege of being the host is um i get to ask my get to ask my own questions but i actually i'll jump in with with uh with our guests first because it's the polite thing to do but i have some of my own um so uh we're wondering what do you think willard would be working on today what would her cause be? She's clearly a person who, who had a cause, right? It, or worked on causes. And what would her cause be today? I That's a great question. I really think that Willard would have been very motivated by issues of economic justice. Uh, in, in many respects, Willard was the consummate I, late 19th century optimist. And... I think, again, it's very easy to kind of look at her and say, oh, she was so naive. Uh, and when you look at the social struggles and the, the wars of the 20th century and the kind of world we live in today, I think it would have been, it would have broken her heart. Um, but as I, as I have said many times before, if she had lived a little bit longer, I, I think she would have probably had learned to, to uh, drive an automobile, uh, that was her nature. But I think Willard was very motivated by uh, economic reform. And I think again, that the, the way that she, she had a strong sensitivity to the plight of the poor uh, is, is, is very much, uh, would have been very much at the top of her agenda. Interesting. Um, so with that question, with that answer in mind, um, did Willard know Jane Addams? And if so, did her work in the settlement house, how did the, how did Adams work in settlement home uh, intersect with, with Willard's work? 
I I wish I had explored that a little bit more in my book. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I do mention Adams, and and certainly Willard knew Adams, and the two women knew each other. Uh, I they they were certainly on friendly terms, and I do think again there there is a lot of similarity between the the when you look at at. Uh, the settlement house movement, which is so integral to Chicago's history. Uh, Willard was very, very much aware of it and very supportive of it. Uh, I, in talking with a couple of other scholars, uh, and I think this was, this is very true. Um, Adams was very much a progressive in the early 19th century sense. I, I think Willard, particularly in terms of economic issues, was, was becoming much more radical, particularly in terms of uh, emphasizing democratic socialism, seeing that, uh, that, that that was really, again, sort of the, the way that the U.S. needed to go. Um, but, but I think part of what Willard saw with the Settlement House movement, and also, again, a lot of the Settlement House movements in Chicago, besides Jane Addams, you have people like Mary McDowell, you, you have uh, Graham Taylor in the uh, in, in, in University of Chicago Settlement. There, a, a lot of these, these movements, again, were paralleled by the work that many different women's groups from both in secular uh, channels, but also in, in, in church related groups uh, were, were doing. And, and, and Willard was all for it. I mean, she loved the idea of, of women taking up that kind of work. And, and she even started, she didn't call it a settlement house, but she called it, uh, uh, I think the term she used was home missions, which was mm-hmm. kind of the, uh, the, again, the religious equivalent yeah. of, of the settlement houses. But again, so many of these movements come out of Chicago. Yeah, uh, well, we're we're kind of proud here of our, you know, <laughs> you should be <laughs> of yeah. our yeah. progressive roots. Yeah. Um, yeah. So tell us, Chris. My guess is I I, I know from talking to you earlier that you uh, spent time in Evanston in the early '90s when you were in school, and then again, obviously, some time when you were researching in that. So tell us um, a little bit about your impression of Rest Cottage. Did you ever see it when you were here? Oh the, like, yes. Yes. Okay, so tell us what you thought that what you thought of it, what you what your impression was, and then maybe how it's changed as you've gotten to know Willard so much better. Well, I I I mean it's it's a very interesting thing because when I uh, I started researching the book, well, I actually probably the early research outside of of the Willard archives was was probably started around 2015 2016, but. I made several pilgrimages to uh, the Willard archives. I like uh, you're keeping the religious theme going. Yes, oh. yes, yes. Uh, but but some of you are aware of just the the, the incredible uh, repository of papers that that are in the archives. But but I, in a lot of respects, I mean, Rest Cottage is a is a is a beautiful place to visit, and it's like stepping into a time machine. Uh, you to walk into Willard's office, for example, which has been spruced up quite a bit. Uh, but but you you it's the little things I think. Eden, you know, you see books on the shelf, you get a sense of what she was reading. Uh, when you see the dining area, you can kind of imagine uh, her uh, sitting, you know, standing next to her mother. Uh, greeting different visitors to uh, to Rest Cottage, but but there is again, I mean, and, and I've I made reference to this. I th- I think for those of you who have not read uh, Willard's book on Evanston, it it gives you a very vivid picture of of what Evanston was like, and the difference now be t- compared to back then, uh, I think Willard from the front stoop of Rest Cottage, she would have had a beautiful view of the lake. 
and and I think I think that that was a bomb for her. You know, I think uh, Lake Michigan really served as as kind of a bomb, and she would again talk about the oak trees and the the sense of peace and tranquility that came to her from being in Evanston. That's yeah. She will, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certain you're right. And I'm certain that she fed on it. Um, uh, so you said that she was a political animal. Um, was she naive in the political game? Can, can you kind of give us a little, some examples of her? I, I think she was maybe a little bit naive in terms of outcomes, but, um, Part of what I don't shy away from with the book is to talk about the fact that Willard, like most reformers of that time period, many of the WCTU women came out of the Republican Party, which again was from the perspective of that time, that was the party of Lincoln and the party that stood for uh, many social causes that we would probably label as progressive. But Willard, uh, like a number of people, was becoming very dissatisfied with the way that the Republican Party seemed to be backing away from some of that earlier uh, commitment. So she saw in what was called the Prohibition Party an opportunity. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, one of the things that I think kind of broke, I don't say it, it didn't break the WCTU apart, but in the final years of her life, um, Willard faced the challenge from many women in the organization that said, wait a minute, we're losing track of why we were founded. We're taking on all of these social issues. What about temperance? But Willard was very skilled. Some would even say maybe a little bit manipulative, particular at national conventions. Uh, in terms of getting her way. See, the thing is too, and I think Willard would acknowledge this, uh, the qualities that we might say are manipulative, if it were a man, we would say that they're savvy, they're smart, they, you know, they know how to kind of get their way. Yeah. But, but Willard's ultimate goal, again, was to kind of create, and this was, again, 18, particularly in the early 1890s, this is a theme in the United States, you have so many third party movements. And Willard was really trying to bring together kind of all these different segments of the reform, you know, of reformers to, uh, to back prohibition, uh, the rights of labor uh, was, a, was a major cause for her and woman suffrage. And in some ways, she almost succeeded in that. But, but one of the things, and I, I talk about this in the book, uh, one of the things that she learned very painfully was that sometimes the people who hurt you the most are not your enemies, but those who say that you're friends. So she got very tired and weary of having to deal with a lot of men who on one hand would say, we're for it, we're with you, Francis, but when push came to shove, would would oftentimes turn their back. So I think, you know, there is maybe a certain naivete about what Willard could realistically have accomplished. But in terms of getting her way in the organization and pushing these issues, she she knew what she was doing. And and she could be very shrewd and 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 very harsh too. There were many former. She lost a lot of friends who who uh, she ultimately cut off because they crossed her. I think yeah. We maybe we all have a little Francis Willard in us. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, so here's a question that um, it's kind of a maybe a more philosophical question and and. So I, I wanted to say this personally. I really appreciated how you ended your talk and talked about the the um, the strife between uh, Ida B. Wells and um, Francis. And I also, I, as a historian myself, I'm troubled by um, our all of our inability to sort of judge 
19th century, 18th century, 20, early 20th century people by the standards um, that we uh, that we hold now. And I'm mm -hmm. I'm not saying this in any way to for to forgive Willard. Um, and, and she's certainly not the only person who falls into this example. And, and my other, so my question, and, and here's a related question, but these might just be more food for thought than questions, which is how are, how are we ever going to change the perception of, for example, the Women's Christian Temperance Union? Um, you know, in, in Evanston, for, for sure, you know, I, I truly, I'm not positive it's still this way, but it was, it was almost like a joke. Aha, Evans, mm -hmm. you know, WCTU. And um, without no, so <laughs> there you go. There's my non-question. Yeah. Um, how, how can we appreciate Frances for all that she did and this really, really large life that she led? Like all of us, she had faults, certainly. Yeah. Um, and understanding that times were very, very different. Things that were a popular thing to do or say um, in, in any person's lifetime may be very out of favor, you know, in the future. And, yeah. uh, and so as historians, how do we, and like I said, this may not be a real question, but rather food for thought. How do we reconcile, you know, what we know I mean, it, 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 much can be said about, you know, the, our constitution framers, right? That they live very uh, unequal lives. Well, I this is where I think the teaching of history is so important, Eden. And, and I think part of the difficulty we face now we, we live in a society, I, I think in the US, there's always been a sense of the present moment is the best moment. And <laughs> there, you know this, and any historian knows that the past gets judged on contemporary terms. And on one hand, I, I do see the point of that. I think that, that oftentimes what can motivate a person to wanna to study history is when they relate it to what's going on in the present. That, and, and I do think particularly with someone like Willard in her time, you can see so many parallels. Uh, and, and even from the standpoint of an issue, I mean, Willard argued equal pay for equal work. That's mm -hmm. still contentious today. So, but, but I think the problem becomes and you were implying you were really hitting on this that where where the the the, the contemporary context just dominates everything and you you really begin to insert worldviews and and ways again that that can be very dismissive uh, instead of trying to wrestle with the past on its own terms and trying to figure out how people lived, uh, we insert our own causes. And consequently, the list of people who pass muster with us gets smaller and smaller. Um, I think, again, that that when you look at a situation like Ida B. Wells, you, you have to acknowledge that it does point to a larger issue of, of racism in the United States. Mm -hmm. but, but I also think, particularly when you look at someone like Willard, you, you also have to measure her by many of the things that she did right. I mean, Willard, I mean, this is not to excuse her, but she was no different from Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, mm -hmm. other white feminists of that time who said some really atrocious things uh, about racism. But I, I think, you know, we, we really, really lose something. And, and, you know, the WCTU gets into a whole nother issue because, I mean, the, 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 the it still exists as an organization, but I don't think um, 
I would just say I don't think there's much about it necessarily that Willard would would recognize mm-hmm. as as that organization has has really embraced kind of a mantra that's very much like what you see with uh, the religious right in this country now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, what you were saying at the end about the Republican Party, it's you know. Um, <clears throat> The, the how an organization starts is not always how it ends. And this is not political pro or con, but rather just an idea about how work changes and the yeah. WCA focus changes and the WCTU. So it, well, fascinating. So thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, so much to think about. It's so much to think about how we, um, how we do our jobs, how we disseminate history. Yes. Um, it's, <laughs> it, I'm sure we're, <laughs> it's good. People will be talking about that, that particular question for many, many, many years. So. And, well, and I think too, Eden, you know, just to kind of go back to it, that your point there, I mean, that's where I, I think when you talk about the, the, the kind of work of, of the, 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 the Evanston Historical Society, the kind of importance of, of not just remembering the past, but becoming active interpreters of the past, mm-hmm. um, to read, to reflect. And, you know, the thing that's great about Chicago, Greater Chicago, is it, as it is in Boston, you, you walk the streets and you see reminders of that history every day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, part of what we sometimes do is when we live in a place like that, we kind of take it for granted. Uh, but when we stop that, then I think we 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 get a fuller sense of 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 you know when we go back past the Willard House or when we go past a, a certain monument or a place that makes us remember, it's not it's just not a, it's not a relic. It's alive in some place, and and that is very important. I think again to the historian's task. Well, that seems like an excellent place to, to, I won't say end our conversation, I'll say close for now our conversation. Chris, I can't thank you enough. This was so interesting and such a wonderful way for us to end our our season uh, on a real high. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Eden, so much. I really enjoyed it. This has been wonderful. And thanks to everybody who joined us. And I hope to see you uh, soon at the Dawes House or at the Willard House. Take care, everyone. Thank you.